Well, good morning. We are in a brand new month and we're going to race across the pages of Proverbs into a new chapter this morning, 21 uh, as well. All right, we begin uh, our lesson today at the end of Proverbs chapter 20, and that is verse 30, and then we will move from there. Here is uh, our text this morning. I really turned in too many Proverbs. I was very ambitious this week, and then I thought, who am I kidding? I never get through all this, so I'm going to pare this down a little bit. Uh, Proverbs 20, beginning in verse 30. Uh, Bruising wounds scour away evil, and blows make clean the inmost body. 21.1, you're familiar with this. The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord, channeling, channeling it like water. And particular to those who please him, he returns it. Uh, 21 2, every way of a person may seem upright in his own eyes, but the Lord is the one who evaluates hearts. 21 3, to do righteousness and justice is more desirable to the Lord than sacrifice. And 21 4, a haughty look and a proud heart, the lamp of the wicked produces sin. Here's the way I'm going to teach these Proverbs. Uh, 20 30, the word of God changes a man from the inside out. The word of God changes a man from the inside out. 21, one, the secret of the believer to accomplish much is here. The secret of the believer to accomplish much is here. 21, two, True wisdom is real righteousness. True wisdom is real righteousness. Here's 21. Three, the wise focus is on the daily walk. The wise focus is on the daily walk. And we'll try to get to 20, verse 4, and that is the expressions of wickedness. The expressions of wickedness. Well, here's our exposition for this morning. Proverbs 20, verse 30, bruising wounds. Your translation may read blows, stripes, scour is the New American Standard, clean the English Standard Version, away evil, and blows makes clean, or you may have polish, the innermost being. Like we have seen often in life, physical punishment supports the acquisition of wisdom. We've all seen and heard those testimonies in the past of people that were brought low on almost to the point of total destruction. And then in turning to Christ in that providence, that situation, that circumstance, God slowly, surely begins to put their lives back together and they live a very robust and 
profound spiritual life. Look at this. Line one, blows, bruising wounds. Look how nice and neat this proverb is, how it's tied to the predicates here in both of the words used. Scours away and makes clean. Very nice and neat. Uh, line one, bruising wounds. These are two separate concepts, really, uh, but translated in the English as just one word, wounding. Genesis 4.23, wicked Lamech, testimony to his wives, that's wives in the plural. He said, I killed a man for, and here's our word, wounding, wounding me. Wounds here, abrasions, left by a whip, left by a cane. David uses the word in Psalm 38 verse 5. He says, in the day where there were no antibiotics, that he had these abrasions and they festered and blistered. That's what he tells us in the psalm. Here is line one, scour. It's the removal of dirt, scours away. Hard rubbing for vessels, pots, spears used that way in Leviticus chapter 6 in verse 28. But here, notice it is the spiritual work that is going on, not physical. It is the work of removal of moral evil. That's used back in the Proverbs chapter 1, verse 16. The foolish try to influence the son who was raised in wisdom in the home and where wisdom was taught. And the parents say, Proverbs 1, 16, they're this crowd of the wicked, their feet run into evil, there's our word, and make haste to shed blood. So it's a reference to moral evil. Line two, blows, different, a different word altogether from wounds that we had, line one. The emphasis here is on the condition that the body is left with. Isaiah 1.6, it translates it blows as raw sores. Such activity, says Solomon, needs to be made clean. It's different from scours. And this word is found in 1 Kings 7.45 for the work of purification of the elements in the tabernacle going on. Now you'll find this interesting. Look at this term, the innermost being. That's uh, translated in wisdom literature as the bridal chamber. The place inside where there are no visitors. Teaching us that man is fundamentally changed from the inside out. Uh, the heart, the center of the man in Proverbs, that's where the changes need to take place. And all the outward expressions of trying to change a man doesn't really change his nature on the inside. Believer's Chapel is committed to the ministry of teaching the scriptures. We, we don't have ceremony here. We don't have a lot of programs for ceremony because the elders recognize the fundamental truth that it is the word of God that changes a person fundamentally. And that is from the inside of that person. His inner man is now different. And we saw expressions of this in the Gospels when our Lord Jesus would make the demons flee 
from a person. And what did we find their condition to be after the demons fled? They were peaceful. They were calm. Because the change <laughs> occurred on the inside. The Apostle Paul, he says in 2 Corinthians 5.17, If any man be in Christ Jesus, he is a new creature. You may look the same, but you don't act the same. You don't think the same. Why? Because you're new, all over new. Not refurbished, not refixed up. You're new. And the Word of God is what does that. And that's what Believer's Chapel believes and is committed to here. Now, here we go into 21.1. Racing across these pages together. The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. This is a proverb with a real insight into accomplishment. I hope to show you that clearly. See, the king is the vice regent of the Lord in Israel. We discussed that little mini tutorial on the king and what the king was the last time we were together. He is the visible, tangible expression of God in the land of Israel. His hands, his feet, his eyes, his mouth, they are the will of God for the people. Now, how does the King, how is he to conform in doing that? Well, he's to keep a copy of the law in front of him all the time. And so his title, king, means he represents total and sole power and authority. That's so different to our minds today. But that's the king. And this is why that in the... New Testament that the apostles tell us to pray for the king. Pray for him. Pray for his decisions. Beseech the Lord on behalf by faith for the king. Now, look at line one. Here's the opening of our proverb. The king's heart. What is that? That's his inner core, his thinking, his wishes. His decisions, he determines the direction of a land. And yet, says the great Solomon, it's really the hand of the Lord all the time. He is the ultimate ruler, power, and authority going on behind the king. Now, here's the insight, not to be missed. Nehemiah was a great man of accomplishment. He is a surprising fellow by all that he did in his life. And he was just a cupbearer to the king. And he was a pagan king after all. He didn't really move the dial. He was just an administrative server. He worked in the personnel department. And yet, what you learn about this fascinating man is that he never presumed upon the king. Never presumed anything. What did he do? He prayed. He prayed. Here it is visually. He beseeched the Lord for the king who was in front of him. And the king then opened the doors for Nehemiah. It was prayer before human activity. That's what I need to learn. I'm always human activity before prayer, and then I wonder why I never get anything done. I have no accomplishment. Well, 
Look at this. Here's the physical manifestation of it. The Lord's hand. That's an anthropomorphism. That's taking a visual human characteristic of the body and applying it spiritually. It, the hand is the sovereignty and providence of an invisible God. Here's the way Daniel uses it. Daniel chapter 4, verse 35. All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing, and he does according to his will among the hosts of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. Sovereignty. Providence. And then he says this, and nothing can stay his hand. It's a figure for his invisible attributes. Here's line two. Look at the comparison. It's a simile like channels of water. It's a figure for the decisions that he renders. Water is especially precious in this region of the world. It takes great skill and power to direct water's chaotic nature. So the king needs. He needs guidance. He needs wisdom in order to channel his decisions to common blessings for the people of the righteous. The decisions here, notice this clause, very important in the proverb, to those who please him, noting the direction of the king's passions, what he is really interested in, after all. Here's the insight. So here's another Jewess who serves under a pagan king and she accomplishes much. But how does she do that? Her name was Esther in a foreign land, not given to the scriptures. And now we have a crisis. We have imminent danger. For the people of Israel. What are we going to do? We're going to pray. We're going to fast and pray. We're going to fast and pray for three days. And then very courageously, she is going to go to the threshold of the throne room. And if the king, who he, she hasn't seen in three weeks, doesn't extend the scepter to her, she'll be killed on the spot. High trauma. And so she comes. She comes to the throne room, and the king sees her, and he says to her, well, here's what he says, Esther 5.3. What is your request that I might give you even up to half of my kingdom? You know what you call that? You call that the open door. But... What was it? It's the same thing you saw with Nehemiah. It is beseeching the Lord with the king in front of you, and then you wait. You sit still, and you wait on the Lord. What's he going to do? How is he going to work? So what's the lesson here, this proverb? We're not a people that have kings. But we are the subjects of a great king who has an invisible kingdom. So how do we accomplish much? Well, here it is. Prayer. Prayer, then waiting. Sitting still. And letting the Lord, who we beseech, let him be the power, the pressure to get things done. And then what happens? Then we just walk through the open doors and everybody says, how did you do that? How did you accomplish that? Because you waited and you prayed and you didn't lift a finger. That's how. 
Okay, here's two. Every way of a person may seem right in his own eyes, but the Lord is the one who evaluates. You may have uh, examines, uh, ponders, weighs, hearts. This proverb is very close to 16.2. All the ways of a man are pure in his own eyes, but the Lord weighs the spirit. You know, I really blew it when I taught this previously. I looked at this proverb and I thought to myself, my gosh, this is such an important word of God for the believer. And I think I whiffed it. I whiffed it. But I got a second chance. And here it is, 21-2. And I'm not going to miss today. So, follow me. Let's start with a proposition. Human beings do not define standards. Human beings do not define standards. Only God defines standards. Let me give you a proverb to launch us off together in that proposition. It's Proverbs 30, 20. This is the way of the adulteress. She eats, she wipes her mouth, and says, I've done nothing wrong. Teaching us what? Teaching us that when we live by doing what is right in our own eyes, In our own eyes, very important phrase, eyes, we have no objective ability to know good from evil, right from wrong, north from south, east from west, spiritually. Our minds are messed up. If you've been listening to Dr. Brown during the weeks as he's been teaching on apologetics and presuppositions, you have learned all about the noetic, N-O-E-T-I-C, noetic effects of sin, the apprehension of the mind. It's messed up. You can't dial the channel in to get the signal. Here's the apostle. Romans 12, 3, let no man think, think, let no man think more highly of himself than he ought. Why did he say think? Why didn't he say behave? Because as a man thinks, so he behaves. It all starts here. It starts in the mind. And what's the apostle's admonition? We need God's word in order to think rightly about ourselves. Men can't do that. We need to think straight because the scriptures are true north. 24-7, 365 a year. They are the perfect mirror that show us who we are and what we are. Let's go to the heart of the problem. It all started in the garden. See, we bought the lie. To eat the forbidden fruit, our eyes would be opened, knowing good and evil. All a lie. It was all a lie. Every bit of it. Our eyes weren't opened. Not at all. Look, here's an eyeball. And so the man and the woman in the garden, their eyeballs, they surveyed the garden and what did they see? Everything was an expression of God. The creation shouted out to them. They understood it. It was all traceable. It was real reality to them. And then they ate the forbidden fruit. And what happened to that eye? That eye went from here 
to hear. Right there in the heart. How do we know that to be the case? How are we sure? Well, what's the first thing that happened? They knew they were naked. They became self-aware. Self. Self. And then they hid. They were afraid. Man's eyes, his life, his zeal, his energy, all turned to self. That's what happened. So everything then becomes me, my, my, and mine. And I run everything through my grid of my thinking. Now that's Acts 17. The Apostle Paul, Mars Hill, stands up, speaks to the Greek philosophers. He presents the gospel. How does he present it? He presents the sovereignty of God and the providence of God. You have surrounded by all these gods. But let me tell you about an invisible God, he says, who's sovereign, who is providential. He determines the times and the places that all men would live, he tells them. And then he tells them about another man, one man, one man who will judge everything, all of creation, by everything. This one man is the determinative factor. They listen to that message, these philosophers. And what they say? Some believed. Some believed on the spot. The hot iron of the gospel penetrated their hearts. And what did the other say? Well, think about these things. So we're going to take your message and we're going to run it through our grid because we know right and wrong. What's the first recorded words of Samson? Here it is. Judges 14, he says, I've seen a daughter of the Philistines in Timnah. Now get her for me. For she is pleasing to me. Never mind what the scriptures say about you marrying a Philistine outside the confines of the people of Israel and what the Word of God says. Get her for me. It's what I want, when I want it, where I want it, and how I want it. That's the mind that we exited the garden with, and it's still there. God created us with a governor. You know, a governor over a motor, your lawnmower had a governor. So if you went up the hill, it didn't double clutch. It kept everything steady and flowing. If you went down the hill, the same thing. Everything stayed steady because the governor watched over the motor. Well, God gave us a governor. It's in our DNA. It's the way he made us. It's called a conscience. But what did we do? We violated our conscience, of course. Didn't take us long, did it? Going through life, we walked through those trip wires. Ah, oh, your conscience. No, we tripped through those. No problem. Till we came to the point in life that we all together just singed that conscience. Yeah, here's your illustration. You take your hand, you put it on the hot stove, and you say... I don't feel a thing. And we're all screaming and yelling. You're burning your hand off. You're destroying your hand. Well, see, that's what we're doing when we're teaching the book of Proverbs. We're telling everybody, you fools, you're destroying your lives. And what does the fool say? I don't feel a thing. Because I've singed all my conscience. So, Here's the point. We have no ability, we do have no ability whatsoever to evaluate ourselves. I drive up and down I-35 and here's my obsessive comp compulsive personality. These 
bugs hit my windshield. <laughs> and it drives me crazy. And it's gotten to the point where I'm such an old man and such a stickler, I will actually pull over on the side of the road and clean my windshield. <laughs> And my wife, I get in the car to fill up her car, and it looks like she's driven through a 10-hour bug war. <laughs> and I come into the kitchen and I say to her, how can you live like this? <laughs> and she looks at me and just shakes her head. <laughs> it's my obsessive compulsive personality. But I get in my car, I've cleaned my windshield, and I'm back and I'm driving, I'm so happy. But if you were to ask me, now, how clean is your windshield? Oh, it's clean. Clean? Have you run a white cloth over your windshield? Well, no, I haven't done that. So it is relatively clean. Yeah, yeah. Not surgically clean. No, not surgically clean. And what is surgically clean? Is it that relatively clean? I mean, haven't we heard stories of somebody catching a germ in a surgery and an infection breaks out? There's a germ somewhere in that pristine room we call surgically clean. See, it's relatively clean. It's not God's clean. God's clean is real clean. I teach this Friday morning Bible study to all these business guys. And I'm always trying to think of stories that would they can identify with because they're all in pressure packed jobs and businesses and uh, I try to help them think through the scriptures so one morning I was thinking about this concept and I said well wait a minute here it is 1 Samuel 25 11 it's Nabal it's David coming to Nabal David has protected Nabal's sheep herders he has been a wall to protect them and uh, like a radar. And so at the shearing season, when everybody gets paid, uh, David sends uh, 10 men to Nabal. He could have sent 50. He could have sent 100. He has 400 fighting men, not counting women and children. He's got a big enterprise to take care of. He sends 10. He's asking for a tip. I need a tip for what we have done, the service that we have provided. And what does Nabal say? Here's what he says. 1 Samuel 25, 11. Why should I take my bread, my water, my meat for my shear? and give them to you. There it is. That's the heart of man. It's all about me. And uh, that night he goes off to his club, he sits at the bar, and he tells everybody how he dealt with that riffraff David. But there is something very important here for the businessman. I want you to listen to me. There's something very important in this story because it is, once again, relative reality to actual reality. Here's relative reality. He's made a killing. He's a big shot. He's talking at his club. Listen to me. Here's how I handle things. He's a tough guy. He's a hard negotiator. He knows his numbers. Real smart. He didn't have to go to Harvard Business School to learn his ethics. It all comes out. Me, 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 and mine. But here 
is not the relative reality. Here's the real reality. While he is in the safety and the confines of his club, the king who has an invisible kingdom, remember that, has an invisible kingdom, not one you can touch, taste, smell, not then and there. He is strapping on his sword and he's coming to his front door. Now, the story, of course, 1 Samuel 25, is that Abigail intercedes. Now, that's relative reality. Here's real reality for all these Nabals that are running around the confines of our business world today. I know them. I've met them. I've been in meetings with them. They're face biters. I've had my face bitten off more than I could tell you. They explode. You tell them something they don't want to hear. Short fuses. Smart. Gifted. Talented. But little do these Nabals know that there is a king who has an invisible kingdom. Can't see it. Can't see it today. But the scriptures say in an appointed time, he is going to come and he is going to come with a sword and he is going to come to their front door and there will be no Abigail to intercede. It's called walking on the thinnest of ice. And that's the daily life of the fool. Let me give you one more story. That one was economic. Here's another one. This is personal. Comes from the Old Testament. You've heard it before. It's a rich man. He has all these sheep. Many, 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 many sheep. And here's this poor man. He has one sheep. One. And... The rich man says, I'm going to throw a banquet. So he kills one of his own sheep. No, he steals the one single sheep from the poor man. Carves him up and has a banquet for his friends. And Nathan the prophet tells the king that story. And the scriptures say that the anger of the king burned and he declared that man shall surely die interesting isn't it understood the story understood the punchline followed the argument but he never saw himself look at your proverb every way of a person may seem upright in his own Eyes. Human beings do not define standards. Only God does. Here's what compounds our problem. It's a world of darkness. Darkened and demented minds. Let me illustrate. Let's say hypothetically, I live in a Catholic region of the city and uh, I know a number of Catholic guys and let's say hypothetically I would go to their table and say you know I've been asked to teach a Bible study at Believers Chapel in Dallas and you know I just got to thinking I think it, the wise thing for me to do before I ever teach that study is to go right around the corner and celebrate the Mass. What would they say to that? Well, here's what they'd say. Oh, that's good. That's very good, Mike. Good. Good for you. Well, what's, what's the reality? Not the perception. What's the reality? Well, to celebrate the Mass, I'm crucifying Jesus Christ all over again. That's what the Mass is. Here's the irony. They're so-called 
first pope, Peter? He says, 1 Peter 3.18, Christ died once. One time. The just for the unjust. So, to go back and recreate the death of Christ and to participate in that, that's an abomination. There's no foundation for that at all. It is perceived to be righteous, but it is at its heart very unrighteous. How do I know that? Because that's what the Scriptures teach me. Not my thinking, your thinking. It's what is true north. It's what is real reality and real righteousness. One more illustration. What if I were to different audience? Go in and say, you know, I'm teaching this class at Believer's Chapel. And, uh, you know, I got to thinking. I really, you know, I need to, in order to go in there, I need to pump up those good works. You know, I just make sure that the wind is at my back. What would they say to that? The common, the ordinary guy on the street. Oh, that's good. That's good. That's really good. You've got to build that ledger, you know. You can't ever have enough good works. But what do the Scriptures say to that? Well, here's what they say, Romans chapter 4. For if Abraham were justified by works, you see, that would be my check. My check waving it in the face of God. Look what I did. Look what I accomplished. But to him that does not work, said the Scriptures, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith. Faith in what? What is the faith in? Well, here it is. It's in the person who is totally unique above all people, Doing the work. The one person who can do the one work. So I am to believe in the person and the work that he accomplished. And in so doing, as I trust that, as I rely on that, My faith is reckoned as righteous. That's what the Scriptures say. That's not my thinking. That's what the Scriptures say. That is real righteousness. That is real truth. That is real right thinking. Let's finish the proverb. Look. Top line, observe carefully, way, it's in the singular, telling us this is a representative for each person individually. So it is every, that is opening the proverb, that's all people, fools and wise alike. Now look at these important two words, may seem. See, it's not speculative. This is the evaluation of oneself. And only fools follow their own self-evaluation. Human beings don't define standards. Only God does. So, here's the proverb. That's you, that's me, that's our demented mind, and that is a darkened world that pushes us on and tells us, hey, you're okay. You're okay. It's all relative. It's the blind leading the blind, and that's taking us to hell. Upright. What is that? It means straight. We've seen the word before, Proverbs 23, 31. Don't look at the wine when it sparkles in the cup. When it goes down right, that means straight. That's the word. No curves, no bends, no twists. 
straight. So, look, line two. But the Lord. Now, who is the Lord? That's the voice of the burning bush. He knows all. He made all. He determines all. He runs all. It's his invisible hand. That's the name of the burning bush. And he is the truth. And what is the truth? Here it is. He evaluates. Not by my standard, but his standard. Literally, the word means to estimate, to measure. Hannah uses it in her prayer. 1 Samuel 2, 3. For the Lord is the God of knowledge, and by him actions are, and here's your word, evaluated, weighed, measured. There's the word. So what's this proverb saying? Here's what it's saying. No self-trust. No self-trust. I could care less the opinion of the world about me, what they think of me. I've got one standard, and it's Him. And I need to boldly pursue Him because He is true north. He is real righteousness. Not what people tell me, not what I think, but what He says. You're at Believer's Chapel. You're at Believer's Chapel for a reason. Because you've heard the voice of the great shepherd. He speaks the truth. How do you change? From the inside out. How do you change? You change when the Word of God penetrates your heart. Now you're a different person. You think and you act differently. That's what this ministry is committed to. And this is the place you need to make that commitment for yourself. For yourself. To grow and be all that God in His grace has determined for you to be. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for our time of study in the Word this morning. Thank you for this church that has been raised up in your divine providence to serve the people of God through the Word. Thank you for the leadership that goes on here. Thank you for the service. Thank you for the commitment and the convictions that go on here. Change us, transform us, make us your people, renewed by your word again. In Jesus' name, amen.